In this episode, we talk about the correct rules to capture a usable time domain signal. You will learn how to compare and make correct settings so that you will not miss any frequency of interest. My guest today is Ramnek Sharma, a certified CAT3 vibration analyst. Welcome, Ramnek. Um, I'm glad to have you here and that you share some of your valuable knowledge with us. So the stage is yours. Okay, so baton is in my hand. Before I start sprinting, I would like to thank Joost, my colleague, for providing me an opportunity to express or sh to share my know-how with you guys through this video. So let's get started. Today, as we know, time signal is basis of all the analysis. Means, in other, in other words, all the analysis plot like Envelope spectra, FFT spectra, time synchronous averaging spectra, all are derived from time signal. Time signal give you much more information than any other prod because it's a root of your, of your analysis. In fact, in some cases, if we compare time signal with FFT spectra, time signal reveals much more clear indication or gives much more clear hint of the problem. To explain or to validate this statement, I will take two examples. Herein, the first example is a machine that is out of balance. The time signal looks very sinusoidal, and FFT has a dominant 1x turning speed frequency. In this case, both these plots give you a hint of unbalance. Okay, it's fine. But in second case, there is a fan driven by a motor via belt drive, and this belt has a localized fault. And whenever this localized fault passes over the pulley, it will create a transient like this, like this, and like this. So it is clearly visible in the time signal. But if you see the spectra, it's a bit, uh, I need to put too much of brain what's going on with this machine. It's really important to look into the time signal and in second example, time signal give you a clear picture what's the problem in the machine. There are some other example where time signal has an upper hand to diagnose the problem like gear monitoring, like a slow speed bearing monitoring, time signal plays very vital role. But there is a basic challenge. The challenge is to capture a accurate or a correct time signal. In other words, to capture a time signal that must contain a frequency of your interest. So frequency of interest means if I am uh, looking at the BP, FI, ball pass in a race frequency. So I should, uh, I should capture a time signal that have this frequency there, okay? As a fact, we know that any vibration sensor gives you an analog signal. Let's get, let's have a look on the flow chart or a flow, flow diagram, how we derive a time signal. As it's a known fact that any vibration sensor give you an analog signal or generates an analog, pure analog signal. This analog signals have uh, all the information what we needed. But nowadays, this analog signal is converted into digital form via A to D converters. And this, why the digital form? Because digital form is easy to man manipulate and also easy to store. That's the reason why we convert this analog signal into the digital form. Digital form is nothing but reconstructing of this analog time signal by joining the discrete dots to form a shape of your analog signal. So maybe if it is clear, these are the dots which we join to form or reconstruct the analog signal. And these dots are called samples or number of samples number of samples, okay? And the rate at which these sample is been captured is called sampling rate, means how fast these samples are being captured during a process of A to D conversion. And this is called sampling rate. 
So now we have two parameters for time signal. One is number of sample, these discrete points, and the sampling rate, that how often or how fast these point has been captured. So this is number of sample, and this is sampling rate. And the third parameter is a time frame or a time window, how long this time window is. So it's a time period, time period in time domain. So we have three parameters in time signal. One is a time period, second is number of sample, and third is the sampling rate. And these all three parameters share a relationship. And what is that relationship? It's T is equals to number of samples divided by sampling rate, okay? Now there are some rules for each of these parameters so that so that you can end up with the correct settings. If you follow these rules, I'm sure you will be able to capture a real good signal and you will not miss the uh, frequency of your interest. Let's go one by one to these rules. Let me rub this first, okay? <laughs> so first we put in this formula again. Number of samples. and sampling rate. So the first rule is for sampling rate that it is a Nyquist theorem and it is known by most of you guys. It says that your sampling rate should be greater than twice the frequency of your interest. It means your sampling rate is greater than twice the, or you say twice the frequency of interest. So this is the first rule. It is very, very important rule. If you don't follow this rule, you end up, or in fact, I should say it differently, to avoid aliasing, you should follow this rule. If you don't follow, or if you capture a less number of samples, then you, you end up with a frequency in the spectrum which is, which is not present in the machine. So it is a, aliasing is, is an error that occurred because of, because you are not following this rule. About aliasing we will talk or we will discuss in next videos, coming up videos, but this is important. This is the first rule that your sampling rate should be twice greater than your frequency of interest. Okay, first rule. Second rule for the time period. Your time period should be at least able to capture six shaft revolution. Okay, six revolution, at least minimum of six revolution you should capture uh, in the time signal. So, and the third is for Number of samples. Number of samples is always a two to the power, like for example, two to the power eight is 256, then two to the power nine, 512, two to the power 10, 1024, two to the power 11, 2048, 2 to the power 12, 4096, and so on. The rule says that you should capture minimum of 2048 samples, minimum. 4096 is better, but minimum you should capture 2048 samples. Let's have an example. My machine is, machine is running at 755 RPM. So it means it's 29.7 hertz. And one rotation, one revolution would be, would be covered in this much of time, 0.034 seconds. As a rule, what we said, you should capture minimum of six revolution. So how much? 
time you need to capture six revolutions, six multiplied by 0 0.034 seconds. So it ends up with 0 0.205 seconds. Okay, correct. What is the formula? Formula says n is t is equals to n by fs. So you have a time, you have a number of sample, as we said, it is 2048 or 4096. This is better, but minimum you should take 2048. So what's the time? 0 0.205 seconds and 2048 samples and FS you can calculate. So FS is 9984 samples per second. You, if you have two of these parameters among three, you can calculate the other one. In most of the analyzer, most of the system, you have an option to select time and number of samples, and the sampling rate would be calculated automatically, keeping in, keeping in mind that you need to capture six revolution and this many number of samples. So now, our aim is to compare these three parameters, which we defined in time domain, and to correlate these settings in frequency domain because as we stated in, in our, uh, uh, during starting of this video that all the signals are being derived from a time domain signal. So when we derive a frequency domain signal with this time domain signal, we will have a correlation of these parameters. What it means? Time domain, And here it's frequency domain. What are the parameters? Or this is the formula T is equals to N by Fs. So N is the number of samples. Samples. And Fs is the sampling rate. How these parameters is being transformed when we convert a time signal in frequency domain? This n becomes your line of resolution and fs become your f max. It's not becoming directly, but they have a relationship. If you divide n by 2, you will get a line of resolution. Okay, and same for the sampling rate. As we said, sampling rate should be greater than two times your frequency of interest. Okay, so Fs divided by two is equals to your F max. So this is this, if we, can, if we change this into equal to, then if we put this, these two values here in this form, you will end up with this formula. So you can correlate number of samples as line of resolution and FS in the F max. So whenever you working with FFT, you need to think in reverse. Means you need to think in terms of number of samples, sampling rate, and the rules what we stated earlier, okay? But there is one, uh, not a problem, there is a one thing that I need to mention. So here I need to mention one thing, that this line of resolution, as we said, it is divide, the, its number of sample divided by two. But because of anti-aliasing filter, nature of anti-aliasing filter, it's not true. Okay, as we said, you, you deduce a line of resolution by dividing number of samples by two. So, if we go back in the number of sample, 2048 is 256 samples, and 2 power 9, it's 512 samples, 2 to the power 10, it's 1024 samples, 
and so on. And if we divide this number of samples by 2, it ends up with 1, 2, 8, 256, and this becomes 512. So, this is nothing but your line of resolution in terms of frequency domain. Okay? But because of nature or a characteristic of anti-aliasing filter, this factor will increase to 2.56. It's in the real world. And that this value become 100, 200, 400, 800, and so on. And you have a possibility to select these values, not these values. In the real world or in an actual practice, you will select these numbers, not these numbers. So I just need to mention that the factor of 2 will increase from 2 to 2.56. So in summary or in totality, the conclusion is that you can compare your time domain signal in same like in frequency domain. Just need to remember what settings you need to take to capture the frequency of interest. Keep the three rules in your mind and you are good to go on field. And thanks for your attention and I, I hope that you learn something from this video and appreciate if you comment for your likes or dislikes. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much for this very interesting tutorial, Ramnik. So here are three takeaways again. First, you must capture a minimum of six revolutions of the shaft rotation. Second, to avoid aliasing, the sampling rate must be greater than twice the frequency of interest. And finally, third, the correlation of sampling rate and number of samples in time domain with the line of revolutions and Fmax in frequency domain. Thank you for your attention. Please feel free to leave your comments in the section below. We will also be happy to receive your suggestions for upcoming videos. And stay tuned with Intelligent Machine Monitoring. <laughs> it's really you can put it in your comment in the comment section. No, sorry. Bro. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Easy. So 2 to the power 8 means 526. That's right. Just a moment, I will check if it's right or not. Yeah. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Just just one question. Uh, 200, 2 pi 8 isn't. 512. 200 and, no, 212. Yes, you are right. You must be honest, that's the awesome. 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 Very good. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I did it wrong. But thank you. Okay. <laughs> you should look for. You should the monitor me. The operator tells you what you have to. But the rest is correct. The rest is correct. Yeah.